welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Western Stories. This story comes from Lux Radio Theaters. Original air date's March 12th, 1951. The title is She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, and I hope you enjoy. Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring John Wayne, Mel Ferrer, and Mala Powers in She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The history of the United States Cavalry is one of daring, accomplishment, and romance. And in our play tonight, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, we present a colorful drama from its glorious past. As our stars of the RKO screen success, we present one of the most popular actors of today, John Wayne. And co-starring with him is a very versatile artist, Mel Ferrer. And one of the most beautiful young actresses in Hollywood, Mala Powers. We wish to congratulate John Wayne on receiving the Photoplay Gold Medal Award as the most popular actor of the year. And hope he'll continue to appear in such fine American pictures as John Ford's great production of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. We know the ladies have been always been color conscious, whether it was yellow ribbons in their hair or gay-flowered handkerchiefs in their pockets. And they've always depended on Lux Flakes to preserve these colors. And now, Lux with color freshener is more wonderful than ever. Here, she wore a yellow ribbon, adapted from the famous story by James Warner Bella, starring John Wayne as Captain Brittles, Mel Ferrer as Lieutenant Cohill, and Mala Powers as Olivia Dandridge. <laughs> It is 1876. Custer is dead. Custer and over 200 men of the 7th Cavalry. It's more than just a victory for the Indians. It is a signal to unite. Kiowa, Comanche, Arapaho, Sioux, and Apache united in common war against the United States Cavalry. Our post is far to the south of the Little Bighorn. Fort Stark, isolated. Kind of lonely for some, I guess. Anyway, this day started like a thousand others before it, with Sergeant Quincannon standing in the doorway of my cabin. Good morning, sir. 542, sir. 541. And a lovely morning it is, Captain Darlin. Colder than blazes. News? As follows, sir. Mrs. Jameson had her baby. The stagecoach run from here to Sudrose Wells has been discontinued. And there's a dispatch rider in from the Desert Patrol. Well? Private McKenzie got himself shot, sir. Boy or a girl for Mrs. Jamins? <laughs> a little trooper, sir. When does the stage stop running? Finish, sir. No more stagecoach, sir. McKenzie? Is he bad off? No, sir. A uh, good man, Quinn Cannon. He'll make corporal in five or six years. Yes, sir. Well, scratch another day off that calendar. Just six more days, Captain Darlin. Six more days and you're retired, sir. I am well aware of that, Quinn Cannon. Uh, the army will never be the same without you, sir. The army is always the same. The sun and the moon change, but the army has no seasons. But here you are in your prime, sir, and they're turning you out to pasture. That's a willful abuse of the taxpayer's money, sir. The only tax you ever worried about was on whiskey. I beg your pardon, sir. I guess you have a reason for busting in, Mr. Cohill. Sir, Sergeant Tyree's just entered the post. He's got half the Paradise River Patrol with him, sir, and the paymaster's coach. Keep talking, mister. Well, the paymaster's dead, sir. Gunshot wounds. Dead when Tyree found him, sir. Where? Near Red Beauty, said, sir. The money box is gone. Mm, gunshot wound. Yes, sir. Though the coach is stuck full of arrows, too. Well, tell Sergeant Tyree to report at once to Major Alshard's quarters. Take over mooring inspection, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. And tell Tyree to bring one of those arrows with him. Now, let me look at that arrow again. Uh, 
You sure it's not Kiowa, Captain? No, and it's not Comanche nor Arapaho either, Major. Not with those color bands. Sir, with your permission, I... All right, Tyree, put in your two cents worth. Well, sir, these arrows with the yellow, white, and red bands are the signs of the southern Cheyenne. And I've seen bannocks and snakes with the same color. Yes, sir, but looking at the clan mark, this mark right here, it's the sign of the dog. Then tell me, what in blazes would Cheyenne be doing this far south? That ain't my department, sir. Alert the post, Sergeant. Yes, sir. And get some rest. Thank you, sir. Well, Nathan, any ideas? Mm, I'll go out in the morning, pick up the patrols, and drive those Cheyenne back where they belong. Well, let me think on it, Nathan. I'll let you know later. <laughs> the day wore on. Now, life within a post isn't all spit and polish. Take Lieutenant Pennell, for instance, and the Major's niece. Pennell's got a buckboard, and it's a fine day for a drive. Only he's having a little trouble at the gates. You heard me, Mr. Pennell. The post is on alert. Nobody's leaving the ground. Oh, now, wait a minute, Cohill. You heard me. Sorry to spoil your outing, Miss Dandridge. Sorry, indeed. Because I wouldn't trust you to take me on a picnic last Sunday. Now you're hazing Mr. Pennell. You just drive right on through, Ross. If you don't, I will. You touch those reins and I'll slap you in the guardhouse. You wouldn't dare. Someone placing you under arrest, Miss Dandridge? It's Lieutenant Cohill, Captain. He suddenly decided that he can order me around. Sir, I was merely following I orders. believe you interrupted the lady, Mr. Cohill. He certainly did. Now, I don't want to make a scene, Captain. But First Lieutenant Cohill has made up his mind that Second Lieutenant Pennell hasn't rank enough to be seen in my company. Sir, if I now could I just... Ex- you're interrupting. Uh, yes, sir. Any further complaint, Miss Dandridge? Complaint? Oh, I'm not complaining, Captain. Aha. Uh-huh. Mr. Cohill, wipe that grin off your face and state your case. Sir, I have denied Mr. Pennell permission to leave the post. Mm-hmm. And for what purpose did you wish to leave the post, Mr. Pennell? Picnicking, sir. Picnicking? Miss Dandridge, where? In St. Louis? Oh, no, sir, just up by the waterfall, sir, but I'm sorry... Never if apologize, I... mister. It is a sign of weakness. Mr. Yes. Cohill, I see no reason why Mr. Pennell should not go picnicking. Very good, sir. Thank you, Captain. But, Miss Dandridge, Mr. Cohill was quite right in denying you permission to leave under the present emergency. If you will be so kind as to get out of the buckboard. Oh, but really... Your arm, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Pennell, you may proceed with your picnic. This way, Miss Dandridge. Ask Lieutenant Pennell. Yes, sir. Where'd you say you were holding your picnic? I'll tell you where. At Delmonico's in New York about two months from now. With Olivia, see? And I won't be wearing any blue suit either, bub. Get it! The Major sent for me early that evening. He had made up his mind. I guess there's no other course to take, Nathan. Find those Cheyennes and push them back. Oh, uh, by the way, here's the last report on Custer's outfit. 212 men, Nathan. Headquarters expects a hard and bloody winter. Sitting bull preaching a holy war. Uh, I want you to take every precaution. These names. George Armstrong Custer. Tom Custer. Boston Custer. Calhoun. Cook. Yes, I expect you knew most of them. I expect I did. Harrington, Keogh, Miles Keogh. Yes, Mac. A hard and bloody winter. Oh, uh, Nathan, those flowers over there, Abby picked them. She thought maybe for Mary's grave. Oh, well, I was figuring to stop by there now and... Yes, I know. Never miss a day, do you? Oh, thank her for me, will you, Mac? They're real pretty flowers. It's nine years, Mac. Nine years last month. The flowers here, Abby, are from Mary. She raised them herself. Well, only six more days to go and your old Nathan will be out of the army. Haven't decided what I'll do yet. Somehow, I just can't picture myself back there on the banks of the Wabash, rocking on a front porch. Oh, I've been thinking that maybe I'd push on west to the new settlements in California. Anyway, I'm taking the troops out in the morning, some Cheyennes around, so I pick up the patrols and drive them back north. My last mission, Mary. Hard to believe, isn't it? 
My last? I hope I'm not intruding, Captain. Why, no, ma'am, not at all. I was just... I know. I've watched you come out here so many times. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself this morning. You made a fool out of a couple of young lieutenants. That's never against Army regulations. Then I'm forgiven. You're forgiven. Thank you, Captain. Good night. Good night, Miss Dandridge. She's a nice girl, Mary. She reminds me of you. At dawn, the troop was mounted and ready to leave. Till Sergeant Quinn Cannon came up driving a wagon. Just what do you think you're up to, Quinn Cannon? Get out of that wagon. I'm begging your pardon, Captain Dodd, and it's orders. Major's orders. Orders? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd best be seeing about them side saddles, too, sir. Side saddles? Are you trying to tell me? I'll be at Major Alshard's quarters. All right, all right, Eddie. Hold on, Ethan, hold on. I know, I know. What in blazes does this mean, side saddles? A covered wagon filled with women's junk. I can't hamper this patrol with a wagon, particularly this patrol. Nathan, I'm sending my wife and niece with you. What? They're to go as far as Sudro's Wells and take the stage east from there. This is an order. That, I want to protest that order. I expected you would. There's pen and paper, so put it in writing. I intend to. I sat up half the night with this, Nathan. I, I can't keep Olivia here. She ain't army. I'll say she ain't. For the following reasons. You want some coffee? No. Yes. One, there is a party of Cheyenne raiding this territory. I have a feeling that every woman will... How many R's are there in territory? Two. Oh. Here, here's your coffee. (laughs) Poor Abby. She says everyone will think she's running away. And what about me? I'll be a bachelor all week. And in conclusion, I respectfully protest the decision of my commanding officer... To saddle this troop with his female relations. Uh, one L in relation. At this critical hour, sign Nathan Brittles and so forth. It sounds very good, Nathan. I'll be glad to file it. Oh, believe me, I I hate to hamstring you this way, but mm. you will take every precaution. Of course he will, dear. And how did marching through Georgia take the idea of old Iron Pants riding with him? Under protest, Abby. Written protest, Abby, of course. It's always my pleasure to escort old Iron Pants. Well, as long as you're going along with us. Abby, that is the dad-blamedest outfit I ever did see. Quinn Cannon's old britches. A little baggy, I suppose, Nathan. But they'll do for the trail. Now, where's Olivia? Is she ready? She's been ready for an hour. She's probably outside with one of your lieutenants. Well, kiss the old man of yours and say goodbye. Time we get out of here. (laughs) And I hope you approve of my uniform, Mr. Cohill. It's very becoming, ma'am. And I notice you're wearing a yellow ribbon. Well? For uh, Fennell, huh? How do you know it isn't for you, mister? I'd be very happy if it were for me. Very happy indeed. Morning. Trooper Dandridge reporting, sir. Well, and a proper trooper, too, and right pretty, don't you think, Mr. Cohill? I do indeed, sir. And a yellow ribbon, Miss Dandridge. Do you know what that means in the cavalry? A sweetheart. It does. Who's it for? Why, for you, Captain, of course. For me, huh? (laughs) I'll make these young bucks jealous yet. I brought your mount, Olivia. May I help you? Thank you, Mr. Pennell. I, uh, I hope you're wearing that yellow ribbon for me, ma'am. Why, who else would it be for? Hurry up, Aunt Abby. They'll be leaving without us. So we left the post. Just another routine mission. Folks waving goodbye, kids yelling, dogs barking. Only one thing in particular caught my eye. As we rode past the store, I saw Mr. Rinders, the sutler, in the back of the stable. He was hitching up his buckboard. Some hours later on the trail. Sergeant Tyree reporting, sir. At ease, Tyree. Well, like you told me, sir, I took cover till Reiner's left the post. I've been trailing him ever since. He went southeast, Captain, about a mile below the painted pole. Mm. There's two men waiting for him in a wagon. You recognize them? No, sir. 
and it didn't seem prudent to inquire. Now, what do you suppose they were doing that far south, and why did Mr. Rinders leave the post in the first place? He's a storekeeper, sir. That's right, licensed to sell merchandise to folks all over this territory. Only the post was on alert, Mr. Tyree, so I ask you again. What do you suppose Mr. Rinders and two strangers were doing that far south? Well, sir, I reckon that ain't my department, sir. Ah. Take a point, Tyree. We'll probably pick him up on the next go-around. Romantic, isn't it, Mr. Andridge? Guidons gaily fluttering, bronze men lustily singing, horses prancing, and bunions aching. Must you always be so vulgar, Mr. Cohill? Well, the cavalry doesn't go in for refinements, Mr. Andridge. Cavalry? This ridiculous business of dismounting and walking every hour or so. You might as well be in the infantry. Well, we soon would be if we didn't ease these mounts. Why don't you ride in the wagon with Mrs. Allshaw? No, thank you. And if you don't mind, I'd like permission to ride back along the line. Why? If you must know, I'd rather share the dust back there with Mr. Pinnell. Haven't you already thrown enough dust in Pinnell's eyes? Why don't you give him a chance? Mr. Cohill. Yes, sir? Relieve Mr. Pinnell with the rear guard. Yes, sir. Everything under control here, miss? Thank you, Captain. Everything's just fine. An hour later, Tyree found something he wanted me to see. I told Cohill, Pinnell, and the bugler to tag along. Far off against the hills, a long, low cloud of dust was rising. Traveling in the same direction we are, sir. Toward Sudro's well. Uh, can you make them out, Sergeant? Looks like a rap hole, sir. Field glasses, Mr. Pinnell. Yes, sir. They're moving the whole village, wagons, lodgings, and all. Mm, yeah. Tyree, I don't know where you got your brains, but God must have given you that pair of eyes. They're Arapahoes, all right, heading the same way we are. Now, why would they be moving on Sudro's Wells? My mother didn't raise no sons to be making guesses in front of a Yankee captain, sir. <sighs> well, I'd soon find out if... Uh, there's no use even thinking about it. We can't risk it with these women. Arapahoes. Yes, Mr. Cohill, and I don't like it. So we'll turn east, gentlemen. Give them a wide berth. But we'll lose half a day that way, sir. The ladies may miss the stage, sir. Would you rather that they missed their scalp, sir? Get back to the column, both of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, shut up. By late afternoon, we reached the canyon country. With any luck, we'd be at Sudro's Wells by morning. Thought you didn't like the wagon, Mr. Andridge. You don't have to shout, Mr. Cohill. My aunt's trying to take a nap. Well, I've only got one thing to say to you. Why don't you take your hooks out of Ross Pinnell? He's got the makings of a good officer. You are not his guardian, nor mine, Mr. Cohill. Well, I'm telling you just the same. Ross is a spoiled rich kid, and the Army's his only chance. So if you can't take the Army, leave him alone. Just before dusk, we reached the rim of a valley. And down below was a sight that I likes of which I hadn't seen in years. Why? Why, they're buffalo, sir. I admire your intelligence, Mr. Cohill. First time the herd's been this far south since the, uh, summer of 68. That right, Quincannon? Correct, sir. Ah, it looks just like the good old days, sir. Mm. Buffalo meat and whiskey, 50 cents a gallon, sir. You ever see a buffalo, Mr. Pennell? No, sir. Well, I doubt if the ladies have either. You may escort them as far as those rocks. The view might please them. Thank you, sir. And what's your thinking, Mr. Tyree? And don't tell me it ain't in your department. Well, Captain, if I was a young, hot blood like Red Shirt, anxious to show off before them Cheyenne dog soldiers... I'd be walking in front of one of them council forests and I'd tell them that I was the one that made the medicine that brought back the buffalo. Mm. I'd tell them how all us engines should stick together now, quit quarreling, and drive out the rest of them Yankee soldiers. That's what I'd tell them, Captain. Though, of course, I'm just guessing, you understand? Mm, yeah, well, of course, now, I'm just guessing too, Sergeant, but if I was an Indian agent, maybe a licensed sutler with the name of Rinders... If I'd met up with a couple of men near Painted Post who might be gunrunners, I'm guessing I'd be mighty close to that council fire of red shirts ready to do a land office business in repeating rifles. How good's that mount of yours, Tyree? Best in the troop, sir. Uh, make for the Paradise River. Pick up the rest of the patrol there, then proceed at your best pace to Sudro's Wells. Have them hold the stage for the ladies. Yes, sir. And tell them that I've... I've been delayed. <laughs> 
If we kept moving all night, we'd reach Sudro Wells by dawn. But just before daylight, we saw a strange glare in the horizon. That's no sunrise, Captain. That's a fire. It's the settlement, sir. Sudro's Wells is over there. Shut up, the lot of you. Ladies to the rear, Quinn Cannon. Yes, sir. First two sets of fours. Forward, you! We rode into Sudro's Wells at top speed. But all that was left was a huddle of survivors and a pile of ashes. We'd come too late. In just a moment, our stars will continue with Act Two of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter with the Lux Movie News of the Week. Reporting, John, that a Polynesian sarong has made another star. Not that pretty Deborah Paget hasn't already proved herself a star, but personally, I think 20th Century Fox did her an extra favor when they cast her in Bird of Paradise with Jeff Chandler and Louis Jordan. 17-year-old Deborah didn't climb the ladder of success. She practically flew up. But it's not surprising. She has actors aplenty on her family tree. I just wonder what her ancestors, Baron de Steger and Lord Paget, would say to that sarong. Deborah, in Technicolor, makes one of the prettiest Polynesians I've ever seen. Louis Jordan falls in love with her, but native taboos complicate their courtship. Uh, just one bit of advice, girls. Bird of Paradise doesn't have a happy ending. So take along your handkerchiefs. You'll have a lovely cry. Does Deborah wear sarongs throughout the picture? That's right. And Deborah doesn't need Paris designs to look beautiful. The studio did make one important improvement on native washing methods. They took an eight-week supply of wonderful new Lux with color freshener to Hawaii, where the picture was filmed. It was so important in the Technicolor shots to keep Deborah's bright Polynesian prints sharp and dramatic, they wouldn't risk any other way of washing. There's nothing in the world just like wonderful new Lux with color freshener. Hollywood studios insist on it. And the stars themselves say it's more marvelous than ever. This remarkable new Lux is ideal for white things. You know how often white blouses get yellowed or gray-looking. Well, new Lux with color freshener keeps them dazzling white as new. Prints have such zing and snap you can hardly believe your eyes. All colors stay bright and beautiful just the way you want them. Thanks for the tip, Libby. If new Lux with color freshener does that for a sarong, think what it can do for your spring prints, your summer dresses and blouses. Why don't you get a big box tomorrow? I'm sure you'll love it, just as Deborah Paget and so many Hollywood stars do. Give your washables that nice as new Lux look. Now, here's Mr. Keeley, our producer. Act two of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, starring John Wayne as Captain Brittles, Mel Ferrer as Lieutenant Cohill, and Mala Powers as Olivia. Among the survivors at Sudro's Wells were seven men from the Paradise River Patrol under Corporal Quain. Quain had been badly wounded. Uh. Arapaho, sir, they, they jumped us at sundown yesterday, sir. Yes, well, your report can wait, Quain. Doctor, over here. I, I, I better give it to you while I can, sir. They, they had us ringed. At night, we got away. We, we made it to the relief point, sir, but you weren't there. Just Sergeant Tyree uh, alone, I sir. wanted to be there, Corporal. We got here before midnight, and then they... They closed in. Thank you. A good, clear report, Corporal. Show up in your record when you come up for that extra stripe in two or three years. Thank you, sir. Who are they, Tyree? Cheyenne dog party. About 30 Arapahoes with them. They banded up under Red Shear. Hmm. Well, that blows the lid, doesn't it? How many dead here? Five, sir. More and poor Sudro, one other woman, two men. Children see it? No, sir. Found them hiding in the smokehouse. Tyree, I think it's about time I did retire. Sir, um, 
One of the dead is Trooper Smith. Smith? Wasn't for him, sir, that a lot more of us been gone. Smith? I uh, served under him for more than a year, sir. Wilderness campaign. Oh, yes, I know. Mr. Cohill. Sir? Where are the women? They've rounded up the children, sir, getting them quieted down, sir. Assign a burial party, Mr. Cohill. Then I'll want this column moving again within an hour. There's a storm coming up. For who shall believeth in me shall never die. I commend to your keeping, sir, the souls of John Sudro and his wife Martha, Albert Bridges and his wife Annie, and also the soul of Rome Clay, late Brigadier General, Confederate States Army, known to his comrades here as Trooper John Smith, United States Cavalry, a gallant soldier and a Christian gentleman. Amen. Buried the dead and made ready for the journey back to Fort Stark. Captain Riddles. You will go to the rear, Miss Dandridge, where you belong. Yes, sir, I'll go. But I... I want you to know that I'm well aware that all of this is because of me. Because I wanted to see the West. Because I wasn't army enough to stay the winter. You're not quite army yet, miss, or you'd know never to apologize. It's a sign of weakness. For what's happened, only the man who commands can be blamed. Press on me. Mission failure. Yeah, we sure missed the stage, Miss Dandridge. Pass the word. Quain's doing fine. Pass the word. Quain's doing fine. Pass the word. Quain's doing fine. What are they talking about, Mr. Cohill? Corporal Quain. The doc says he'll be all right. Oh, I'm so glad. Why? He's just another dog-faced soldier in dirty shirt blue. What's he mean to you? Did you ever dance with him at the fort? Did you ever speak to him? No, of course you didn't. Quain's not a gentleman. I've been finding that some lieutenant's bars are no guarantee of a gentleman either. You're glad about Quain, sure. But only because it puts the happy ending to the story you'll take back east to your tea parties. Well, now you can tell him you've seen it all. A real Indian fight. A man with an arrow sticking in his chest. Why do you have... That should make your tour just about perfect. If you don't mind, Miss Dandridge. Yes? Mrs. Alshard is a rough time in that wagon, helping with Quain and all. Would you spell her for a while? Certainly, Captain. Thank you. Mr. Cohill, did anyone ever take down your britches and tan your hide? Why, no, sir. That is... Yes, sir. My father, sir. With a strap. Well, I'm just old enough to be your father, bub. Now get out of here. Take a point. <laughs> ah, they'll make a fine, boisterous couple, Captain Dodd, with their marriage. When I want your opinion, Quinn Cannon, yes, I'll... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any time at all. Rain let up that afternoon. And at dusk, I called a halt. We'd stop a while and rest. We needed it. All of us. I wouldn't go any further if I were you. Captain Brittle said we'd be here for two hours. I didn't hear him say anything about taking a walk. There's probably a hundred hostiles out there. You think that's a whippoorwill? Come on, Olivia, let's go back. I can walk alone, thank you. Olivia, please. The old man says don't ever apologize. It's a sign of weakness. But I'm sorry for everything I've said and done. Oh... Honey, you know how I feel about you. Flint. Flint, if you'd only... All right, Cohill. Let's get her over with. Pull your blouse. You crazy, mister? Don't pull rank on me. You've been green-eyed ever since she put that yellow ribbon on. Button up that shirt, mister. Ross, please. You can sneer all you want, but you keep your paws off my girl. All right, mister. I'll accommodate you. Ross, no, no! Button your shirt, mister Pennell. I thought better of you. Four years out here and still acting like a wet-eared cadet on the Hudson. What is this all about, Mr. Cohill? Sir, I must decline to answer, respectfully. Mr. Cohill, it is a bitter thing indeed to learn that an officer who has had nine years' experience in the cavalry, the officer to whom I am surrendering command of this troop in two more days, should have so little grasp of leadership as to allow himself to be chivied into a go at fisticuffs while taps have barely sounded over a brave man's grave. 
God help this troop when I'm gone. Sir, it was my fault. You're at attention, Mr. Pennell. It was a misunderstanding, You'll Captain. You'll oblige Miss Dandridge by getting back to troop area. Yes, sir. Mr. Cohill, you will have the men build their squad fires higher. Make the fullest show of bedding down here for the night. Then we're sneaking out, heading for the river. Is that clear, Mr. Cohill? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Ross. Sorry, Flint. As usual, I had sent Sergeant Tyree to scout up ahead. And as usual, his eyesight hadn't failed him. Hostile, sir. They hold up in a ravine about three miles north of here. Only that ain't all. Well? They got visitors. Our old friend Rinders. Right smart of trading going on right now. Repeating rifles. Mr. Rinders, huh? Well, pass the word to Mr. Pennell. The three of us are going up to that ravine. The darkness helped us. We got to within maybe a hundred yards of the Indian encampment. They'd built a big council fire. There was Rinders and his friends bargaining with Red Shirt over the rifles in the wagon. Well, what's the argument now? Same thing, Reinders. Richard keeps saying that $50 a piece is too much. Too much, huh? Tell that grandson of a horse thief that I know he's got the money. Because he stole it from the paymaster's coat. Yo, Shiva. Tell him I know he killed him, too. That it's $50 or no rifle. We saw Red Shirt raise his hand, then a flash of knives. They dragged the white men, still living, and threw them on the fire. Join me in a chaw of tobacco, Sergeant? No, sir. I don't chaw and I don't play cards. Chawing tobacco is a nasty habit. It's been known to turn a man's stomach. Mr. Pennell? I, I'll take a chaw if you please, sir. Here. Now let's go. You still figuring on resigning, Mr. Pennell? No, sir. When we got back to the column, I called a meeting of the officers and sergeants. All present, sir. Uh, Any time between now and daylight, gentlemen, we can expect an attack. That means the case, the main column, is leaving here right now. We will leave a rear guard under one officer. Sir, I'd consider it a privilege if I Thank you, Mr. Purnell. Your offer to volunteer will go on your record, if you still wish to make a record. Mr. Cohill... Two squads will remain behind. You will be in command. May I have the first and second, sir? The second squad has too many old married men. First and fifth, sir. You will cover our crossing and dig in. Yes, sir. Then pass the word and let's start moving. Lieutenant Pennell reporting, sir. The main column has safely crossed the river, all but you and Miss Dandridge, sir. Stand by. Mr. Cohill, as you know, this is the only crossing within 20 miles. So you've got to buy me some time. You've got to buy me a long day. Then we'll do it, sir. I know you will, Flint. Flint? <laughs> Took you nine years to call me that, sir. And it was well worth waiting for. Well, we'll get you out of here, son. Just hang on. We'll get you out of this pocket by noon tomorrow. Mount your horse, Miss Dandridge. Flint! Flint, Wait! Well, haul off and kiss her, blast you. We haven't got all night. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll be back, man. I'll be back. I promise you. Oh, what are you waiting for, Mr. Pennell? Escort the lady across the river. If you'll follow me. Ross. I'm sorry, Ross. But I guess that's how it is. You and Flint. Yeah, sure. Good luck, Flint. Report can wait till later. Just thank heaven so many of you got safely back here to post. It is my duty to report, Major Alshard. Mission of failure. Oh, fiddlesticks. It was our fault. You did everything and I more have than never a man. worn a coat of whitewash yet, Abby, and I won't start now. I failed at Sudros. I failed to keep Rinder's rifles from the tribes, and I failed at everything. I leave the army a failure. Now stop it. 
You're just running yourself down because you... Blast it, Mac. Hasn't she told you I left Flint Cohill with two squads back at the Paradise? And a sound military move. So, with your permission, I'll start back. I'll have Cohill out of that pocket by noon tomorrow. No, Nathan. The troops can't leave till morning. Morning? They ought to pull out of here before midnight. Well, I'd agree if you were leading them. But Pennell will need all the daylight he can find. Pennell? That babe in the wood? Fording a river against a swarm of hostiles with Winchesters? Nathan, aren't you forgetting something? You retire from the army tomorrow. Tomorrow is all I need. I can't leave Coel facing those devils. It's no one-day mission. This could go on for weeks. All right, then I'll volunteer as a civilian scout, interpreter, anything. And I thought you were fond of Cohill. Fond of him? Every time Cohill gave an order, men would turn around and look at you, wondering if he was doing the right thing. You want to ruin the boy? Oh, I know, Mac. Pennell's got to run his chances, too. We ran him, Nathan. That's what we get paid for. Yeah, I... I guess you're right, Mac. I I guess you're right. Well, with your permission, then, I'll quit the post tomorrow... Permission granted, Nathan. Where will you go, Captain? Go? I don't know, miss. West, I guess. <clears throat> California, new settlements. <clears throat> Old soldiers, Miss Dandridge. Someday you'll learn how they hate to give up. Captain of a troop one day and every man's face turned towards you. Lieutenants jump when I growl and now tomorrow I'll be glad if the blacksmith asked me to shoe a horse. Blast your eyes, Abby. If you start sniffling now, I'll... And as for you, young lady... I'm not crying. I... I'd like to stand up and cheer. At dawn the next morning, I reviewed the troops. My last review. They... They had a present for me. Watch and chain. Solid silver brought in special. St. Louis... It's, uh, it's engraved on the back, sir. Captain Brittles from C Troop, lest we forget. Lest we forget. We had hoped to hold a dance in your honor, sir, but under the circumstances... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You will do me one last favor, Mr. Pennell. Take your troop and proceed on your mission. Yes, sir. Forward! Yo! Good luck, C Troop. Good luck. Uh, stop worrying, Nathan. They'll get Cool Hill out of there. But that's not enough, is it, Mac? Within a week, those hostiles will be here on your doorstep. Then what? Oh, we'll take care of them. Yeah, well, I'll say goodbye. Oh, I left my other saddle in the cabin. Give it to Abby. Uh, it'll be easier on her uh, disposition. Say goodbye to her for me, Mac. He'll do no such thing, Nathan Brittles. Goodbye is a word we don't use in the cavalry. Now come here. Yes, ma'am. Until our next post, dear. Thank you, Abby. Once out of sight of the post, I swung east toward the Paradise River. I had a plan. I had witnessed Rinder's murder, but I had seen more than that. Among the Indians around that council fire, I had seen an old man. A pony that walks. I had known him from years before. Yes, I had a plan. A brief intermission before our stars return with Act Three of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. I've chosen as our special guest tonight Hollywood born Leslie Banning, who is building a very successful career as a freelance actress. Uh, you've made a picture recently at RKO, haven't you, Leslie? Well, yes, I have, Mr. Keeley. But I haven't even seen the rushes yet. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. John Farrow, the director, told me you've done a splendid job. Well, that's good news, Mr. Keeley. You did better than my spy. And who was that? Jane Russell. She's my sister-in-law, you Oh, know. yes, of course. While Jane was working on Howard Hughes' production of His Kind of Woman with Robert Mitchum, I asked her to get some inside information, but she wouldn't talk. <laughs> Perhaps you should have asked Jane to sing. You know, she plays a sultry nightclub singer in search of romance, and naturally, she finds it with Robert Mitchum in this action-packed drama. 
Glamour and sophistication become this new Jane. Practically swooned over the gorgeous clothes she wears in his kind of woman. Nineteen different outfits. Hmm. And judging by appearances, uh, you yourself can face any clothes competition with distinction. Why, thank you, Mr. Keeley. You know, one of the reasons it's so easy to keep clothes looking wonderful is new Lux with color freshener. I've always loved Lux, but this new Lux is the most marvelous ever. Prints look wonderfully fresh, so alive, and colors, well, they practically sparkle. Even my lovely slips and nighties stay so gorgeous looking, I can hardly believe they've been washed at all. Jane and I both love it. A great many other Hollywood stars agree with you and Jane Russell. No other way of washing nice things leaves them fresher or brighter. Hollywood studios say new Lux with color freshener is a washing miracle. This amazing new Lux leaves white things dazzling white. Prints brilliant and gay. All colors dramatically new looking. Even delicate pastel slips and nighties renew their fragile beauty every time you lux them. If you haven't tried new Lux with color freshener, you're in for a real thrill. Get a big box tomorrow. Use it for your washables to give them that nicest new Lux look. Thank you for coming tonight, Leslie Banning. It's been a pleasure, Mr. Kennedy. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on Act Three of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, starring John Wayne as Captain Brittles, Mel Ferrer as Lieutenant Cohill, and Mala Powers as Olivia. I was back with a troop by nightfall. Fennell, to my surprise, had effected the relief of Coe Hill's men without incident. And so far, the Indians had failed to make a move. There's a reason they've held off, sir. We've scouted them all day. They're concentrating forces. How many, Mr. Coe Hill? Close to a thousand, sir. Arapahoes, Kiowas, Comanches, and those Cheyenne dog soldiers. How much time have we got? What's your guess? Well, no time at all, sir, because we've got to hit them first. I'm glad the Major sent you, Captain. The men will feel a lot better about he it didn't now. didn't send me, Mr. Coe Hill. I am not on duty. Then the orders haven't been changed. Orders are orders, sir. But for the next four hours, according to my brand new silver watch and chain, I am still an officer in the United States Cavalry. Flint, if I gave you a written order, would you obey it? I don't need a written order, sir. Nevertheless, you're going to get it. It might come in handy in our court-martial. Sergeant Tyree? Yes, sir. I am ordering you to volunteer again. <laughs> yes, sir. You and me are going to ride out of here, Sergeant, just as soon as I write Mr. Cohill's orders. It's just a pencil, Flint, but I'm using all the official phrases. Yes, sir. You will remain here in your command and don't force any action until I return. But if I don't, then read this piece of paper for your orders. Put it in your pocket. I understand, sir. And now, Mr. Tyree, if you'll find me a fresh horse, we'll take a little ride out toward those hills. Not that it's any of my business, sir, but may I ask where we're going? That's a foolish question, Sergeant. You know as well as I do. Yes, sir. To the Indian encampment. You aiming to powwow with red shirt, Captain? I am not that crazy. No, sir. But there is a chief who might listen to us. Pony that walks. Ever hear of him? Yes, sir, but he's an old man. That makes two of us who've seen enough of war. Yes, sir. In case you don't know it, sir, that ain't a bird. Walk your horse, Sergeant. Hold up your right hand. It's a peace signal. Let's hope they'll see it. They're just over that ridge, Captain. Yeah. Ever been scared, Mr. Tyree? Yes, sir. Up to and including right now. We reached the crest and rode past their guards. They swarmed in on every side, warriors in full paint, crazy for blood. We forced our way through to the council fire. Their leaders, half a dozen of them, stood in front of us. Then Red Shirt fired an arrow at my feet. We come in peace. This Red Shirt knows. 
But he answers with an arrow before we can talk. I take his arrow from the ground. I break the arrow of red shirt. I spit on his arrow. I will speak with Pony that walks. Nathan, Nathan, I am Christian. Hallelujah. Old friend me. Long time, long time. I have come in peace, Pony that walks. Take salt, Nathan, take salt. It was plain that the old Indian was tolerated in the council only because of his years. Red Shirt was the leader of this army and nobody else. Red Shirt, very angry. Lily Shichisaba. Kill. Kill. Much blood. Nathan, old friend, smoke pipe. Nathan, smoke, good. I smoke your pipe, but my heart is sad at what I see. Your young men painted for war. The medicine drum's talking. It is a bad thing. Many men will die. My young men, your young men, no good. We must no stop good. this war. The young men do not listen to me. They listen to big medicine. Yellow hair, Custer dead. Buffalo come back, great sign. Too late, Nathan. You come with me. We hunt buffalo together, smoke many pipes. We are too old for war. Yes, we are too old for war, but old men should stop war. Too late, too late. Soon many squaws sing death songs, many lodges empty. You come with me. We hunt buffalo, get drunk together. Hallelujah. No, old friend, I must go. I go far away. You will go in peace, Nathan. I put Manitou round neck. No harm. Wash Kiola. Wash Kiola. Wash Kiola. Wash Kiola. It appears they're turning us loose, Captain. It's not enough, Sergeant. I had hopes of coming to terms. Terms? With them? One more failure to add to my. There's something wrong, sir. No, nothing wrong. Just glanced to your left there. Kind of casual-like, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well? The ponies, hundreds of them. Hundreds of ponies in a gully where they can't wander off. But if something was to stampede those ponies... Stampede? Yes, sir. Back to camp, Mr. Tyree. On the double. Lieutenant Cohill reporting, sir. Troops ready to move, sir. Command, know their assignments. Yes, sir. The column and single file leading mounts. We are to follow you, sir, proceeding with the utmost quiet. Mm. There's a creek at the near end of that gully. We'll stop there and form ranks. Meantime, sir. Meantime, Mr. Cohill, just pray that the moon stays behind those clouds. True, Paul. Pass the word. Halton, pass the word. Halton. Mr. Cohill, can you read the time by my brand new silver watch and chain? Uh, yes, sir. Twelve minutes to midnight, sir. The gully lies straight ahead of us. On signal, we'll gallop through that draw and stampede the herd out the other end into their encampment. Questions, Mr. Cohill? No questions, sir. Mount and pass the word. 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 Bugler? Sir? A count of three and sound the charge. Mr. Cohill? No casualties, sir. Hmm, no casualties. No Indian war, no court martial. You'll have a time rounding up those hostiles, Mr. Cohill, but they'll not get very far on foot. Take them back to the post, sir? No, back to the reservation. 
Have your soldiers follow them all the way. Stay about a mile behind them. Walking hurts their pride, and your watching will hurt it worse. Yes, sir. Can you read what time it is by my brand new silver watch and chain? Two minutes past midnight, sir. Huh. I've been a civilian for two minutes. It's hard to believe. It's your army, Mr. Cohill. Good luck. Riddles just, uh, just said goodbye and rode away. Is that it, Mr. Cohill? Yes, Major. We got the hostiles on the trail, sir. Then I left Lieutenant Fennell in charge and returned here to report, sir. So Nathan's finished with the Army, is he? Well, the Army isn't finished with him. Who's your best rider, Mr. Cohill? Why, Sergeant Tyree, sir. Then tell Sergeant Tyree I want to see him right away. Tyree? It's been half a week running you down. Sir. If you think you're going to California, Mr. Tyree, no, sir, you're... just bringing a message for you, sir. Huh? From a Yankee War Department by way of Major Oldshaw. I knew it. Dad blasted, I knew it. Uh, where's my spectacles? Every time a man... Tyree. Look. Look what it says. It's my appointment, Chief of Scouts with a rank of Lieutenant Colonel... And will you look at those endorsements? Phil Sheridan, William Tecumseh Sherman, and Ulysses Simpson Grant, President of the United States of America. There's three aces for you, boy. Yes, sir. I kind of wished you'd been holding a full hand. Huh? Full hand? What do you mean, full hand? Robert E. Lee. Oh. Well, it wouldn't have been bad. Let's get back, boy. Major, sir, he's coming up the steps now. Open the door, Quinn Cannon. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Brittles. What? What's going on here, anyway? Just to dance in your honor, sir, to welcome you back. And I might add, you kept us waiting for some time. Well, I'm sorry I'm late, Mac, but I didn't even Don't know Don't apologize, until... Colonel. It's a mark of weakness. Well, oh. proceed, Bandmaster, Proceed. has a request to make. Your arm, Nathan. Thank you, Abby. And sir, sir. Yes, Mr. Cohill? You'd be surprised to know that Miss Dandridge and I are going to be... Why, son, I knew it all the time. Everybody in the post knew it above the rank of a second lieutenant. Right, Mr. Pennell? There'll come a time, sir, when I'll be a first lieutenant. Yeah, in, in 10, 10 or 12, 12 years. years. Will you stay for the dance, Colonel? Well, if you'll excuse me, Miss Dandridge, I... I've got to make my report first. Colonel, wait. Here, please take these with you. Oh, I am obliged, ma'am. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Report? And your flowers. You gave him your flowers. I think they'll make someone else even happier, darling. His girl. So ends the story of Captain Brittles and the troops he led. The dog-faced soldiers, the 50 cents a day professionals, riding the outpost of a nation. From Fort Reno to Fort Apache, from Sheridan to Stockton. Men in dirty shirt blue, and only a cold page in the history books to mark their passing. But wherever they rode and whatever they fought for, that place became the United States. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. Now I know you'll want to meet our stars personally, so in just a moment, Mr. Keeley will be back with them for a brief chat and to tell you about next week's show. But first, I'd like to give you my own experience with this wonderful new Lux with Color Freshener. 
I was so excited myself, the first time I tried it, I could hardly believe my eyes. You know, here in Hollywood, we see so many wonderful things that when the stars themselves say it's the most marvelous thing that ever happened to their favorite lux, you can be sure it's really sensational. I call it a beauty bath for colors. Take my white blouses. They stay whitest white time after time. And my prints, they look so vivid and alive after a lux bath, I think I must be dreaming. Just for fun, I've tried new lux for practically all the colors in the rainbow, and they just sparkle like new every time. Won't you try it? I'm sure you'll love it just as much as I do. Do me a favor, won't you? You'll be doing yourself one. Get a big box of new lux tomorrow and give your washables that nice as new lux look. Now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And here they are to receive your special thanks. John Wayne, Mel Ferrer, and Mala Powers. John, we usually advise the young actresses appearing here to use Lux to help their careers. Now, for the young actors, we'll take a tip from you and suggest football. Well, it is true that I went from football to making pictures, but my wife has always used Lux Flakes, and there you have the complete story of my life. <laughs> well, John, I'm also an ardent fan of Lux Flakes, but I hope that isn't the complete story of my life. Well, honey, you've got a long way to go, and I'd say you're off to a flying start. And that comes from a man who knows. John, I think you're one actor who can truly say that the secret of your success is hard work. Well, that's for sure. I understand that at one time there were nine different John Wayne pictures playing simultaneously in local theaters. Well, I like to be active, Mel, and I try to see that all the pictures are filled with the same. For instance, at RKO, I just finished the Edmund Granger production of The Flying Leathernecks. You can guess what that's all about. We're soon leaving for Ireland to do a film with John Ford. Well, why don't you stay with us at RKO and do another picture? Well, okay, Mel. I'd really like a chance to direct something for hard use like you've been doing. I suppose, John, you're talking about Mel Ferrer's wonderful direction of Faith Domergue in Vendetta. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Hmm. Producing, acting, directing. Now you know the secret of John Wayne's success. Hard work. Well, speaking of hard work, Bill, what are you doing here next week? Mel, we've really selected an exceptional cast for next week's play, and we'll present them in Metro-Golden-Mare's electrifying drama, The Red Danube. And from the original cast, we have three great stars. Walter Pigeon, Peter Lawford, Janet Lee. You won't want to miss this gripping story combined with a tender romance. It sounds wonderful. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night and all our thanks. Here's Ella Raines, one of Hollywood's loveliest young stars, own tip on complexion care. I never skip my Lux Soap facials a single day, she says. They're so quick and easy. I just cream the rich Lux lather well into my skin. Rinse with warm water, then a quick splash of stimulating cold. I pat to dry with a soft towel. Now my skin feels so satin smooth and soft. Try this simple care Ella Raines recommends. It's so easy to be Lux lovely. Lux soap has active lather, you know, that really makes skin lovelier. That's why nine out of ten screen stars use fragrant white Lux toilet soap regularly. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents The Red Danube, starring Walter Pigeon, Peter Lawford, and Janet Lee. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Mala Powers appeared through the courtesy of RKO, producers of Payment on Demand, starring Betty Davis and Barry Sullivan. Heard in our cast tonight were Barton Yarborough as Tyree, Bill Johnstone as the Major, George Neese as Pennell, and Wally Mayer as Quinn Cannon. And Sandra Rogers, Norman Field, Dan Riss, Paul Dubov, and Eddie Marr. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett. The original story was by James Warner Bella. Our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Walter Pigeon, Peter Lawford, and Janet Lee in The Red Danube. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.